This morning, we're going to run through uh, a, quite a bit of scripture, and I, I'll apologize to you now that we're going to read a lot, but I think it's important, and it's what we're here for, so hopefully it's not too much for you. Um, I titled the message today, The Missing Manual, and The Missing Manual, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a great series that typically covers the important items that have been left out of a user manual, so uh, it's, it's made by tech geeks who look at the manual and say, well, that's great, but it's not really helpful. They, they need to know this to, to really use this program. And that, uh, you know, the tagline is the things that should have been in the box. And so I'm, I've titled it The Missing Manual, and uh, I kind of themed it around what would Jesus do. But we're going to take a look at, uh, a, we're going to look at the walk with Christ in a little bit different way this morning. We're going to be looking at the parts that were not included in the box to begin with that seem to have been added later, and we're going to look at the parts that seem to be missed because of the parts that we've added. So it'll be a little bit different, but it's what would Jesus not do that we're going to look at today. We're going to spend some time um, informing what would Jesus do by looking at what he did and by looking at what he did not do. There's a lot that we take for granted that he did not do and that we tend to not notice. So I just thought it'd be fun to walk through John chapter 6 today with that in mind. So I don't know about you, but I am kind of tired at this point of all of the experts telling me how to hack this or hack that in my life so I just want us today, my approach is not to provide answers for you. It is not to provide the answer. It's to ask questions. I want us to sit with the text today and ask questions. I want us to be good listeners together. A good listener doesn't set out to formulate an answer while they're listening, right? So that's all I ask from you today as we walk through uh, John chapter 6. So I started with the main, the end of, of the chapter. We're starting at John 666, which I thought was ironic. Um, I'm a product of the 80s, or at least I was little in the 80s, so that was a big deal in the 80s. You know, the music I listened to all came from the devil and was, you know, scary, and 666 was all over the place for me as a kid. But I, I found it curious as I was looking at Jesus and crowds and the verse, John 666, jumped out at me. So I'll start there. John 666, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of, son of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the 12, was going to betray him. So what I want to explore this morning is what is the this? It says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. What is the this that made up this scenario the way that it panned out? And back at the beginning of John chapter 6 is a story that most of you are familiar with. I won't read the story to you. It's the feeding of the 5,000. It's a miracle. It all started with a large crowd that had gathered that was following Jesus and the disciples based on what they were seeing uh, with healing miracles. And so they were really, they were gathering speed, right? Gathering critical mass here, <laughs> following along behind them. And they get to a place where, you know the story, I think, or you should probably are familiar with the story. They're concerned about, the disciples are concerned about how all these people are gonna eat that have followed them to the, the side of this sea. And, um, and Jesus performs a miracle. There's a boy that has five loaves of bread and two fish, and it's multiplied by Jesus and everyone is fed. Um, there's a part of that story that I had never noticed before that we're gonna come back to later that I'll point out to you right now, and that is verse 12. Verse 12 reads, and when they had eaten their fill, Jesus told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments 
that nothing may be lost. And I never paid much attention to that, but I think it's critical to what's coming in the next day or so that we're about to read. And as a result of Jesus telling them, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost, the disciples went around and filled 12 baskets with bread that came from those five loaves of bar those five or those five barley loaves that they had found 12 baskets of fragments were gathered up the people were amazed and proclaimed that Jesus is indeed the prophet the messiah who has come into the world and he perceives that they are about to take him by force and make him king so he withdraws to a mountain by himself the disciples get in boats and go across the sea to the city of Capernaum Jesus meets them there. He performs another miracle on the way that we won't talk about. He walks on water uh, over to join them across the sea. And in the morning, when the crowd realizes that he's gone, they take off in boats across the sea to look for him. So I want to spend some time right now just kind of talking about Jesus and crowds. I find time and time again in the Gospels that He's uniquely gifted at avoiding them. He often leaves crowds and moves toward a smaller group of people, maybe his 12 disciples or a smaller group than that. He often leaves crowds and moves toward individuals that he can have a face-to-face -face encounter with. He often moves away from crowds into isolation, like on the mountain, with the Father. There's a few things I noticed that we're missing. He doesn't chase them down. He does not spend time chasing crowds down. He doesn't damn them to hell. He doesn't instruct his disciples to set up a table in town to save them. He doesn't start a class to make them understand what he's saying. He doesn't instruct the disciples to start or join a political party to get the people in line. He doesn't organize his own crowd in response or protest to the others. And so it got me thinking, what is a crowd? Well, it's a group of people, right? So it's more than one person. Um, typically, from what I can tell, crowds tend to seek to fill a void or a need, or maybe we could say a tupas, an emptiness. They seek to right a perceived wrong. They seek to build themselves up, the crowd itself. They seek to tear down others not like them. They seek to force their own will. I think it's almost like an egomaniac times a thousand. Sacrifice, they sacrifice people for a cause. Crowds often do. They maybe not all do, and maybe they don't always do. Crowds tend to sacrifice individuals for a cause, kind of like human sacrifice, if you will, but hidden in the false celebration of individuals and freedom. They tend to sacrifice what I would refer to as the human experience. I was driving down the road just this week with this message in mind, and it's changed a lot over the week, um, and I saw this sticker on the back of a car, good human. And I thought, I, I hope it's not your car. If this is anybody's car here, <laughs> I apologize. But um, I thought, who is this person trying to convince are they trying to convince me behind them? Maybe him or herself, or maybe someone else stuck it on there. That's what my wife's going with. Someone else noticed how good of a human they were, and they stuck it on their car, and uh, it was a blessing. So maybe that's the case. Maybe that's the case. Um, but... I, I saw that and I just thought about, you know, crowds tend to justify themselves or tend to justify their purpose or their identity. And I think it's kind of a justification of the flesh. It's ugly. Whether it happens individually or as a group, as a crowd, it's ugly no matter what. We have a couple of crowds uh, in the text that we'll read today. We have we, uh, we've already seen one, the political crowd. 
that was trying to seize Jesus by force and make him king, right? We're gonna, we're gonna make you do what we think is coming because you're powerful and we're gonna put you in power and, and use your power to our advantage. A political crowd trying to, to rally around him and take him by force to make him king. We're gonna see a religious crowd coming up in the later verses who start posturing as a, re, as a result of what Jesus is saying. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Deadwood. If you have not watched it, be warned. Uh, you gotta be okay with some pretty bad language to watch that show. But it's, uh, it's a fantastic uh, old, you know, old West show about Deadwood in the 1800s. And uh, Doc Cochran is one of the characters. He has a quote in that show that really stood out to me when I was watching it. And he says, I see as much misery out of them moving to justify themselves as them that set out to do harm. And he's defending the honor of someone who has an interest, a vested interest in some goings on that happened. And, uh, and I, I just thought it was really fitting for today because we all like to justify ourselves. We all like to justify our group, our crowd, our interests. And that self-justification is dangerous regardless of where you are on an issue. It doesn't matter whether you're on the right, the left, the top, the bottom, the, all sides, it's equally dangerous. But we humans work awfully hard at attempting to convince the world of our love for others, especially us Christians, I think, in America. We work so hard at attempting to convince the world of our love for others, mostly by talking about it, and partly by developing policies around it, and partly by organizing groups around it all the while apparently blind to the fact that it only proves our devotion to our crowds at the cost of human experience, which is relationship. Jesus constantly proves his devotion to individuals, not to crowds. Last week, George Saras shared with us, and he said something that really stuck out to me. He said that he decided early in his life he was going to focus on building relationships, not on winning arguments. And I think that's important. And it turns out that a hidden agenda is not the only kind of agenda that's dangerous. I think agendas in general can get pretty dangerous at times. So let's, um, as we move on, I'm going to talk a little bit about free will. Not going to stay here long. Peter has been talking about free will and Paul, basically, through Peter, as Peter is reading through his letter and trying to explain it to us. Been talking about free will, and it's confusing, I've heard from many of you. And it is confusing. It's confusing for everyone. But I believe that Jesus demonstrated free will for us every time he walked away from a crowd. He didn't seem to value crowds very much, but he did seem to value the people in them. Often the Spirit guides him away from a crowd of people. And the crowd's there for him. They're there to hear him, and he leaves. When's the last time that you sat in silence with the Father with zero distractions? When's the last time you sat with yourself in silence with zero distractions. That's almost impossible today. <laughs> it's very difficult. I think meditation, reflection, and prayer are hugely important to our, our spiritual life, to our life in this world. John's been leading Sacred Space. I know it's on a break right now, but it's a great place to come to learn to do that, to learn to shut off distractions and sit and listen for a while. Well, free will, as demonstrated by Jesus, I believe, is a will apart from this world. It's not driven by the things of this world, which would be the flesh. Peter's given us wonderful images of that. <laughs> we have a good understanding of that, right? The old will, the old self, the flesh, the tupas. There's tons of names for it, but it's all the same thing, and it's our own will here in this world. So a will apart from this world is not driven by those things. It's actually living by the Spirit, on our march toward death. It's a little ominous, I apologize. But in our space-time, 
That's what we live in, a decomposition cycle in this world. Everything is dying in this world the minute it comes into it, it seems. And we march toward death, but we can live. And that's my question today is, we live in a world of death, but are we alive in our world of death? Since I had to miss book club last week, you're going to get to hear my share. So I didn't get to give it to the group. I'm going to give it to you. From Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. Um, the group is meeting again on August 11th, and we're going to be talking about The Scarlet Letter. So if you have, even if you've read it, grab a copy. Feel free to join us. You can email Judy. All the information's in the S News or online. But we read Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury, and I'm going to share with you a short, brief section of that in a minute. Um, it is a story that takes place in the 1920s in a small town in Illinois. And the story that you're going to hear is about a man who is called the Junk Man. And he drives a wagon around the town, basically, and helps people out. And uh, I hope that it gives you an image, because for me, it stood out as an image of what I'm talking about what it looks like or what it can look like to come to life in this world. So as anyone could tell who had heard the songs Mr. Jonas made up as he passed, he was no ordinary junk man. To all appearances, yes, the way he dressed in tatters of moss corduroy and the felt cap on his head, covered with old presidential campaign buttons going back before Manila Bay, but he was unusual in this way. Not only did he tread the sunlight, but often you could see him and his horse swimming along the moonlit streets, circling and recircling by, by night the islands, the blocks where all the people lived. He had known all of his life. And in that wagon, he carried things he had packed up here and there and carried for a day or a week or a year until someone wanted and needed them. Then all they had to say was, I want that clock, or how about the mattress? And Jonas would hand it over, take no money, and drive away, considering the words for another tune. So it happened that often he was the only man alive in all of Greentown at three in the morning, and often people with headaches seeking him amble by with his moon-shimmered horse would run out to see if by chance he had aspirin, which he did. More than once, he had delivered babies at four in the morning, and only then had people noticed how incredibly clean his hands and fingernails were. The hands of a rich man who had another life somewhere they could not guess. Sometimes he would drive people to work downtown, or sometimes, when men could not sleep, go up on their porch and bring cigars and sit with them and smoke and talk until dawn. Whoever he was, or whatever he was, and no matter how different and crazy he seemed, he was not crazy. As he himself had often explained gently, he had tired of business in Chicago many years before and looked around for a way to spend the rest of his life. He couldn't stand churches, although he appreciated their ideas, and having a tendency toward preaching and decanting knowledge, he bought the horse and wagon and set out to spend the rest of his life seeing, seeing to it that one part of town had a chance to pick over what the other part of town had cast off. He looked upon himself as a kind of process, like osmosis that made various cultures within the city limits available to one another. He could not stand waste, for he knew that one man's junk is another man's luxury. That chapter stood out to me because it, it really speaks to a human experience. And that, I think, is what seems to be missing from our interpretation of John chapter 6, and from our interpretation of a lot of stories of the Bible. And I wondered, is it missing, or are we just missing it? The human experience transcends circumstances. The human experience lives in connection with another. The human experience lives in relationship. The human experience lives in the connection between two humans, or multiple humans. Well, let's move on in the text and uh, keep exploring w how Jesus got to this position that he's in. Uh, from, in. So, the people set out across the sea to look for Jesus. They woke up, saw that he wasn't there. 
said, you know, where the heck did he go? I know his disciples went across the lake, so let's, let's go over there and see if we can find him. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. And they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see you and believe you? What work do you perform? They're following him because they've seen all of these signs, but apparently it's not enough. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. There's a few verses I want to look at from this, specifically verse 28 and 29. When they say to him, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And his answer is quite simple. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who has sent, whom he has sent. The crowd wants to know, what next? What next? What do we do with this information? How do we do the will of God? And Jesus basically says, get busy believing. So I have a question. How do you get someone to believe something? How do we get someone to believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Do you nicely explain that God loves them and doesn't want to torture them forever? Do you threaten them with the uh, fires of hell? Do you scare them with missing out on heaven? It's going to be a great party. You're not going to get to be there if you don't, if you don't believe. Do you hand them a copy of the case for Christ? Hey, Lee was really moved by Jesus. You might be too. You should check out his story. Do you start a group or an organization? Do you back the right politician who can pass the best legislation to make little believers? Well, the truth is you can't make somebody believe something. You can't force belief. You can't legislate belief. But you can greatly increase the chances of someone believing something not by any of those things that I just listed, but by loving the person in front of you with the overflowing love of Christ coming through you, by being present with them, by letting the person in front of you know that you see them, by listening to them without judgment, even without trying to help. It's getting harder and harder for people to do in our society. By letting the person in front of you know that God loves him or her, by showing them that you love them through actions, by investing in relationship. There are a lot of details we could argue about on this topic. Fortunately, we serve a God who speaks to us and will guide us if we let him. He will guide us to the people he wants us to share with. Much like you don't have to get rid of all your possessions and roam the earth with nothing, you also don't have to seek people out to force relationship. Just shut up long enough to hear the prompting of the Spirit. Where is he leading you? Who is he leading you to? Who do you get the pleasure of introducing or reintroducing God to? 
I'm not someone who hears from God a lot, and it's frustrating for me. It is really frustrating for me, especially when I'm really trying to hear something, right? Like I want an answer to a question, or I want to know what the right next move is, or um, oftentimes I'll tell my wife, you know, I don't think God cares what the next move is, it seems like, because I'm not getting anything here. So I'm just going to make my next move. And if it's wrong, he better be loud about it when he tells me it's wrong. You know, this get, I get to posturing and building my ego of, well, if you're not going to tell me what to do, then I'm going to do it and you can undo it, you know. Um, but I, when I do hear from him, it's typically very clear, very, very, very clear, even if it's very, very quiet. I always know in that I, somebody says, you know when you know that you know, right? And that, that kind of knowing, I always know. I don't have to question it. I don't have to ask, was that God? I'm like, oh, he did say something. I finally shut up long enough to hear, <laughs> and I didn't try to threaten it out of him, and he, and he gave it to me. Um, verse 33 is another very interesting verse there. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I'd say it's similar to Paul's uh, the circumcised and the uncircumcised, right? It's the world. It's everybody. It's everyone. He gives life to the world. He gives life to the world. He doesn't offer life to the world. He gives life to the world. Let's keep reading. Um, verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me. So this is, yeah, this is really good because he's getting very specific about the will of the Father specifically for him as he's here on the planet inside his earthen vessel, inside his flesh. His will that has been given him by the Father is that, quote, I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. I don't know how much time you could spend arguing about those words, nothing and all. I don't understand why we don't understand as a collective <laughs> that nothing is nothing and all is all. And it's confusing to me that we, that we can't see that. Um, I'm also kind of curious about the term the last day, and I think we'll come back to it in a little bit. But I wanted you to note that verse. So the will of the Father for the Son in his earthen vessel is that he should lose nothing of all that has been given to him, but rather raise it up on the last day. So as you can imagine, the Jews have started grumbling at this point in the crowd because he said some pretty offensive things. It wasn't Moses that gave you the bread. It was my father. I've come down from heaven. Uh, you know, he's starting to say that he's the bread of life. The Jews are getting very uncomfortable. It's not what they expect to hear. You know, there's some elbowing going on. And isn't this Jesus? Uh, Joseph's kid? How can he say he came down from heaven? So those murmurings and grumblings start in the crowd, and Jesus continues. Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now it's getting worse, right? Now, he's, now he might be crazy. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. 
No wonder the Jews are grumbling. He's teaching this in their church, in the synagogue, he's teaching this. So it is absolutely needless to say that it's not what they expected to hear. As he continues, the grumbling spreads. Verse 60, while many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning those who were, uh, Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. So now the grumbling has moved to the disciples. This is where what would Jesus do becomes kind of interesting. Um, now he's dealing with his committed core struggling to understand his approach. I can imagine the elbowing again, Peter to Andrew. What's he doing? What's he doing? What's he saying? It's needless to say, it's not what they expected to hear. Why would Jesus say something so difficult? He doesn't seem to do what we think he should do. I mean, the disciples are probably thinking, you know, He's pushing people away. He's not drawing people to him. This is going to, there's, people are getting very upset. What is he doing? And I just have a question. Do you think he would do that if his focus was on making them believe? Do we think this would be his approach if his focus was on making them believe? I think verse 63 is very telling for us, but often ignored in this passage. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Only the Spirit gives life. The flesh, no help at all. In our flesh, we want to make something happen. It's, our natural, it's as natural and free-flowing as rain. Our drive to do something. I'm going to do something. I'm going to make it happen. Maybe our role in this whole thing is not about saving people. Maybe our role in this whole thing is about living with people. Really living, truly living. Coming alive in a world of death. Being in but not of the world of decay. It seems to me to be less of a requirement for the afterlife and more of an invitation to life here in this space-time, this linear death trap. Maybe it's more about allowing ourselves to be saved, to be able to believe through surrender. So we're back at John 666. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want to go too? You leaving too? You going with them? Simon Peter says, no, Lord. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed, and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus doesn't say, good boy, good human. He doesn't say, excellent choice. You're going to be rewarded for that. You're going to get the biggest reward. He doesn't say any of that. He actually says something that I think sounds kind of negative. He answers them, Did I, didn't I choose all of you, the 12? And yet one of you is a devil. The crowd that walked away judged Jesus as worthless to them and said, we're going to go back across the sea, take our chances over there. <laughs> Good luck with this. I'd hate to see where this goes. He's a great teacher, but that's a little crazy. So they justify themselves, right? I, I can't be a part of this. This, this, 
this isn't right. The disciples can't go away because of their belief. They, they almost, like you can hear in the text almost a, don't be silly, Lord. Where would we go? We, we can't, there's nowhere to go. Don't be ridiculous. We're not leaving. They've allowed themselves to be saved. They've surrendered to the Holy Spirit. They've experienced life through God's Spirit. And they now walk with him. In verse 66, I think it's interesting that he, they say that John says that they turned away and they no longer walk with him. Because that walk is important, I think. And I wonder about Judas. And I have more questions. How long does it take someone to believe something? How long does someone have to believe something? As long as they're drawing breath here in this space and time, they have that long, right? As long as they're drawing breath, they have time to believe something. Did, Jesus, did Judas eventually believe? Is it possible? If he did, what led to his belief? What made it happen? What made it possible? I want to look at some, some um, scriptures together that Jesus has said. Uh, first, let me make sure I didn't miss something. I didn't. Um, over this chapter. Back in chapter, or back at the beginning of the chapter in verse 12, he told us, when everyone had eaten their fill, the miracle doesn't seem focused to me on the fact that everybody ate. The miracle to me is that why are they worried about the scraps that are left over after everybody ate? Why are they gathering up all the fragments of bread that were produced from the miracle? And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. And then he tells us later, let me just get clear with you what I'm here for in this earthen vessel. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. And then his response to Peter's love and affection and appreciation. Didn't I choose the 12 of you? And yet one of you is a devil. It got me thinking about Judas, and it got me thinking about deathbed conversions. I've never offended more Christians with something, with a topic other than deathbed conversions. Really offensive to so many people. Um, I had a friend when I was in a band for a while, he was the drummer, and he always used to say, man, I, first thing when I go before God, the minute I'm before God, I'm going to ask him about the parable of the workers. This was so horrendous to Ray. His name was Ray. So horrendous that somebody could come in in the 11th hour, put in hardly any work, get paid the same wage, and be treated equally to the people that showed up first thing that morning, right? It was so offensive to him. It would be the first question he would ask God when he went before God. And I would laugh and shake my head and say, Ray, <laughs> It's cute that you think that you're going to have questions for God when you go before God. But what if God's the one doing the questioning, first of all? And what if you receive some information and find out that in comparison to many others, you're showing up in the 11th hour? How are you going to feel about the parable then? Personally, this is just me. This is not the gospel according to the sanctuary. It's the gospel according to Brett. I personally believe there won't be any questioning. I believe that there will be understanding and eager surrender in the face of the Father, in the face of Jesus, in the face of God, going before him. Whatever you thought you were bringing as your list will just dissolve and... Uh, and that's just my personal feeling. But I, it also got me thinking about, Peter talks about this sometimes, and it's come up in my mind, hopefully others too, uh, when I listen to his messages. What if your last day, what if your last day is the last day that's referred to in Jesus' passage? 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day, or the lat day. (laughs) Um, what What if your last day is the last day, and you go before the Father, you go before Jesus at the end of your life here in this linear space time. You leave this world and enter the next. And maybe like a switch being flipped, you have more information that you didn't have before. You see the reality in front of you of Jesus and all his glory. This is the second topic that offends most of my Christian friends. And it becomes almost impossible for you to choose not that. Is that the same? Is having a choice that's almost impossible to make the same thing as not having a choice? I don't know if it is. How many of you have ever experienced a Krispy Kreme donut fresh off the assembly line, warm, just plucked from there and handed to you? Can you put it down? Has anyone been able to effectively take one of those into your hand and set it down and walk away from it? I don't know that I could. That is an impossible choice to me because I I can't choose not that warm donut. I'm going to eat it and I'm probably going to have a second one and maybe a third and then I'm going to feel really bad and I'll deal with that later because right now I got to eat these donuts because they're heavenly. Um, is, is, and I know that pales in comparison, but I'm trying to paint a picture to help you think with me. Is it the same thing to not have a choice at all if you have a choice that's virtually impossible to turn down or, or to, to make, uh, virtually impossible not to make? I don't think it is. And so I really feel like we work with limited information in this time and space, and I don't feel like it's cheating or forcing someone to believe something if they get a little bit more information and they believe it. If they look Jesus in the face and they say, yeah, you're Lord. It's like Peter says, no, dude, we, we know. We know. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. That's, I think, at the end of your life, the option that you get. You can still say no, but are you going to? It's warm, it's glazed with icing that's starting to just get crispy, and it's heavenly. So I got to wondering, could Judas be a leftover fragment in our world? What was the rest of his life like after he made his choice? What was the quality of the rest of his time here in our space time, in our little linear section of the universe? Was it spent in outer darkness, away from relationship with his friends, away from relationship with his father? Could he have ultimately chosen Jesus, perhaps face to face with him again after leaving this horrible place? (laughs) It's a great place and it's a horrible place. I love it and I hate it. It's every day in, in our world, right? What about those who no longer walk with him after this incident? Didn't all of them, Judas included, exercise free will and choose to follow a crowd? Another question I had when I read this is, what has the Father given the Son? Just a small portion of the world? I didn't even look up the scripture, but Peter, what has the Father given the Son? All things. things. And I also wondered, does Jesus seem concerned about Judas continuing to follow him for the time leading up to his betrayal? Does he say, Peter, didn't I choose all of you? And yet one of you is a devil. Get him. Set him right or get him out of here. Get him out of my presence because he's sin and I can't be in the presence of sin, right? We all know that. He doesn't order the disciples to convert him. He doesn't send him off. He doesn't banish him. I think we tend to overlook important details when we fail to sit with the text for a while. I think that we overlook important details when we read without wonder, when we fail to ask questions, when we ignore what Jesus does not do, when we fail to put our will aside and have faith like a child. 
when we focus on winning arguments instead of building relationships, when we get caught up in grumbling. Well, it's a lot of questions, but hopefully it is something that you can sit with this week and it will bring you closer to the Father. And uh, really, that's, that's my only desire for all of us, <laughs> is to know him more fully and to surrender to his will for us and to be able to hear his will for us and to live that out in the people around us, not just for ourselves, but for others. And I'm not saying that crowds are always bad. I'm not saying you can't be part of a crowd. I'm just saying, be careful and keep the people in the crowd in your mind and in front of you as much as you can. In Jesus' name, amen. So, on the night before his march toward death ended in our world, our Lord offered himself up. He took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. The bread of life come down from heaven. Take and eat. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, this is my blood poured out for you in a new covenant with you. Take and drink. So please, come to the table, ingest the bread that was given for the life of the world, and be justified from the inside out. Amen. Well, I invite you this week to walk with God in his spirit, to seek his will, to walk with others in that same spirit, to focus on building relationships, not on answering questions. And you might be asking, well, just what are we doing here? Isn't this a crowd? Hmm. It's a group of people, yes. It could be a crowd, but I would argue it's not simply because we don't have an agenda beyond surrender and worship. To the Father. Together in awestruck wonder, we seek the will of the Father and carry it into the world. In sacred space, you can learn and practice listening and con contemplative meditation. And right now, you can go be a good human over a burger with someone else. In Jesus' name, amen.